Krista St. Germain. I love that name, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome to the Midlife Makeover Show. Our topic today is actually a new one that I have not had on the show, Um, but it means so much to me, especially since it is Mental Health Awareness Month. I'll be honest with you, I didn't even know that existed until recently, but I'm so glad that it does. Uh, But we are going to bring light to such what can be considered such a dark subject, right? Um, And we're going to talk about how you turned tragedy into triumph, which is amazing. So welcome to the show. Tell everyone a little bit more about what you do and why you do what you do, which is my favorite question. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I always love it when people want to talk about grief because it's usually something that people kind of shy away from. So I was yes. happy to have the conversation. I never intended to be in the world of grief, to be honest. I just found myself, um, I was 40 and I was kind of on this high in my life. I had met my second husband, first husband ended in like, you know, went down in flames. Second husband was the redemption story proof that amazing relationships are possible. And We were coming back from a trip and I had a flat tire. We'd driven separately and I pulled over to the shoulder of the highway and he pulled over behind me and typical stubborn man. I don't want to call triple a, I can just change the tire. I just want to get this over with and get home. Right. So I'm standing on the side of the road and I'm texting my daughter to tell her we'll be late. And a car driver that we later found out had meth and alcohol in his system did not see our hazard lights, did not see us at all. And just crashed right into the back of Hugo's Durango and trapped him in between his car and my car. So in wow. literally like at a high of my life, just within, you know, a moment, it was just completely ripped away. And what I found was that initially therapy was great. I went immediately back to the therapist that I had and loved, and she helped me get through those early acute days, right. And get back mm-hmm. to functioning. But I kind of reached this place, which I now call a grief plateau where I ran out of resources. Like everybody was telling me, you're, you're doing so great. You you're so strong. And, and like, you can kind of understand why they're saying that because you look like you're doing great. You're getting, you're back to work. You're the kids are getting fed. Like the things are getting done, but on the inside, I wasn't feeling great right on the inside. I was pretty well convinced that my best days were probably behind me. And then I should probably just count my blessings, which made me Mm. kind of want to vomit and, you know, like just get used to what I had heard was this new normal, which to me meant kind of unconsciously resign to what I really wanted. And thank goodness I happened to find a life coaching program. It wasn't even grief specific, but I happened to find something that gave me tools that gave me a different way to, to think about my thinking and really train, Mm. you know, like changed like the whole trajectory of my life. And so once I figured that out for myself, I decided I got to help other women do this too. Right. It was never my intention to do grief work but I realized how much misinformation there is out there, how much of what we know isn't actually helpful is actually holding us back. And I just felt really called to make a difference in that way. So that's what I do now is work specifically with widowed moms and help them figure out how to love life again and, um, you know, create post-traumatic growth for themselves. And I never never imagined myself doing it, but I can't think of anything I would rather do. That's so amazing. I'm so sorry. That's so awful. Yeah. You know, it's, I love what you said about a new way of thinking. Cause I feel like the whole grieving process, that model, if you will, is a little outdated and what it's kind of like with anything in life, what works for one person may not work for another and finding different tools and ways to cope and not just cope. And like you said, the, the new normal, like, what is that really? Right. <laughs> Yeah. Finding that like your way of living life and getting excited again, trying to go from yeah. that whole grief, you know, grieving process into actually like the growth process. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like the conversation at some point, I think around grief just kind of stopped. Like people heard five stages of grief and then yep. that's all they heard and that's all they know. And so then that's what they expect. And then it doesn't match <laughs> their lived experience. And they're like, you know, what the heck? Like, Yeah. I I thought this was what it's supposed to be and it's not at all what it is. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, And so let's talk about what the grieving process, like the, the typical model that you're supposed to follow. I can't even remember what it is. Right. I mean, the only one I ever knew about and, Mm -hmm. and the only one most people I talk to, even doctors, by the way, seem to know about is the five stages of grief. Right. So Mm -hmm. Elizabeth Kubler Ross and David Kessler's work, which in its time was pioneering and really important. And nobody else was talking about it. 
Um, so it was denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Those are the five mm-hmm. stages that they identified. But what most people don't know is that those, you know, that work was based on the study of hospice patients, mm. based on this, on, on anecdotal studies of people who were coming to terms with their own mortality. Yes. And then applied to what it is like to lose someone, right? Mm. It was on, on death and dying first, and then applied to on grief and grieving. Mm. And even Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in her later years really regretted that people took her work and turned it into something linear, right? Mm. and, And they turned it into something absolute. And so she never even meant for people to say, okay, well, first I have to deny and then I have to be angry and then I have to bargain. Right. And if I do those things, if I go through all of those five stages, then poof, I, yeah. <laughs> I get to the place where I'm no longer grieving. Like I'm over it. Yeah. Right? And grief is over and I've done the thing and it's linear and it's nice and it's tidy and it's neat. And that just is not, it's just not how it goes. Right. But, right. but that's the, that's the, the thing that caught on in our popular culture and, and nobody's talking about any of the other grief theories or any of the, any of the other work done since mm-hmm. their work. It's just all you ever hear is five stages. Yep. It's not linear. It's not, doesn't it? What, uh, what helped you to go? Like when you were kind of feeling like you were, you know, going along with your day and everybody's like, Oh, sh- you're doing so good, Krista. But what, what really changed for you that took you from the kind of like ordinary to the extraordinary? Mm-hmm. I think it was a really big realization to me that the thoughts in my mind weren't facts. Mm. <laughs> like, this, the idea, because when I was experiencing it and I was thinking, yeah, my best days are probably behind me. I should probably just be grateful for what I had. Mm-hmm. I was experiencing that as factual. Right. I, I did not know that, that those were just sentences in my mind mm. and that just because they were showing up didn't mean I had to listen, mm-hmm. that I could actually choose to believe that my best days were in front of me, Yeah. Right. that I could still be happy, even if it were a different kind of happy. And so it sounds basic, but for me, it was really big to go, oh my God, that's actually just a story in my mind. And I don't have to believe stories in my mind. Yep. Yeah. We can become our worst enemy, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I can totally relate because like when I was in the dumps of my life, the worst of worst times, that was my realization. I was like, what am I saying to myself? Like Mm -hmm. I really started to become mindful about the ticker tape of (laughs) the voices going across in my head. I was like, I am so mean to myself. Like we have got to change this. And then my goal was, it didn't even feel mean to me. It just felt, it just felt resigned. It just felt true. right? Right. It didn't, And I think that's when it gets so tricky is it's almost easier to spot a critical voice Mm -hmm. because it has like a a kind of a, a noticeable emotional tone to it Yeah, compared to just like, well, I guess this is it. Yeah. They like accepting the, the, you know, like this is it. Right. Yeah, exactly. Instead of accepting a new, a new way of life or no. Yeah. Just knowing that I could actually choose to believe whatever I wanted to believe about my life and myself and my future. Do you feel that when that happened with your husband, when he passed, do you feel like you were like, okay, I've got to grieve. Like I've got to, I got to tackle this grief. Or were you just kind of like all over the place or did, were you like, did you have this mindset of, I've got to make sure that I heal from this? Yeah. So I Mm. identify as like a, uh, you know, somebody who's struggled with perfectionism. So immediately my mind went to, there's probably a right way to do this and a wrong Mm. way to do this. And so I should figure out what the right way is to do it so that I don't do it wrong. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. News, news flash. (laughs) There's no right way to do it, but Uh. that was where my brain went. Okay. So let's try to read all the books. Let's try to do it the right way. Uh, you know, I need to be there for my kids. I need to, to role model how we do this in the best possible way. Um, it, yeah. And, and, and then that was, that was the lens I was looking through. Maybe not the most helpful lens, but not surprising. Yeah. Even when I'm free. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So a little backstory on uh, me. Uh, so my first husband, he passed away at 26 years old. Oh, and so I can relate to a lot of this. Um, yeah. I was young at the time. Well, I still think I'm young, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> 
but you know it's what I had? Yeah. And it's like, I was a single mom. I had two kids. I had just started a business, my own mm-hmm. medical billing business. And I was almost like with the, like, I don't have time. I don't have time to grieve. Like, I'll be fine. Mm-hmm. I'll be fine. I was mm-hmm. yeah, just like you, such a perfectionist to the point where I can make life look perfect. I can be perfect. I'll be fine. It's you know? Fine. And interestingly, grief and loss always catch up with you. They yeah. never like I like time. They say time heals time. That's bull crap. It it does not. Time does nothing for you. Like it. If anything, time is going to remind you more of it. I just did a show the other day yeah. on triggers and how you can get triggered. But point is, like I. I, I had, I went on with life so much that I did mm. not even take the time in my mind to grieve. Yeah. And my brother passed away a few years ago and wonk, it all yeah. came to the surface all at once, which totally yeah. knocked me down on the ground. And I can remember when I got the call about my brother, he'd gone into a coma and I flew from Virginia to Texas and I can remember I had my bag packed. I don't even know what I put in there. And I was debating whether or not I put in a black dress. You know, if I was like, do it. I was like, if I put it in there, then I'm, you know, setting the intention. There could be a funeral. I was like, mm-hmm. but if I don't put it mm-hmm. in there. But I was like, oh my God. And that literally was like, my mind was like all over the place. But I remember I passed in front of the mirror and I realized, I was like, wow, this is like another huge loss for me. Mm-hmm. Like, whoa, oh, here we go again. And I looked at myself, I was like, damn it, you are going to take the time to grieve. You, if you have to quit your job and just set everything, go into a little cave, then so be it. But you are going to give yourself the gift of grieving so that you can actually come out on the other side better and not just pretending yeah to be better right like me tough woman I could you know <laughs> but really deep down all those years I was hiding all of that yeah yeah, yeah. and I think that's super common I don't think you're alone in that I mean how many yeah. people that we hear time heals we hear that and so we're like all right well I guess I'll, and we hear people say just keep busy just stay busy oh yeah Right. As though it's, of course, then we're like, okay, I'll just stay busy. I'll just let time pass. And then something magical surely will happen at the end of one year, because that's what we've heard too. And then surprise, it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. So are there, what have you learned with everything, you know, through the, through the coaching and how are there steps or like or is there just certain, uh, I guess, I mean, is it like a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or is it could be six, two, seven? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, is I it so different wish. for everybody? Yeah. I so wish there were steps. If there were, I would absolutely write them down and tell people, but I think it's just so much more valuable to look, look, zoom out and, and know in advance, you can't do it wrong because there is no wrong. Mm. You can't do it right because there is no right. It is completely individual. Right. Um, and then just generally speaking, go forward with the idea of like, when it comes to grief theory, I love the dual process model of grief. I think for me, that's Mm. been the most useful and for a lot of my clients and what it teaches is basically like, if we divide the way that we spend our time up into two primary categories, so grief related, like loss Mm. related. So we're thinking about it. We're feeling the feelings. We're, you know, doing things that are related to the loss, the work of grief, if you want to use that phrase. And then the other bucket would be restorative activities, things that are, that provide respite that are unrelated to mm-hmm. the loss. So mm-hmm. that might be, that might be just, you know, going out with a friend that might be hobbies that could be anything that isn't loss related. Mm-hmm. And really <clears throat> what that model teaches is that the, the healing can be found in the intentional oscillation mm. back and forth. So we spend some time thinking about our loss and doing the feelings work and, you know, like whatever, talking about it, that could look like a variety of different things. And then also it's really valuable to take breaks and to live and to laugh and to find hobbies and they could do other things. 
And like, for me, perfectionist me, I'm like, must focus on grief, must do all grief things, <laughs> must do grief. Right. Right. And as though like, yeah, if I'm, if I'm not thinking about it, I'm doing something wrong. If I'm not thinking mm, about it, um, like having that like myself. guilt, because you like, right. I should be just so miserable and down the dumps, but yeah, right, like feeling get guilty about this. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then other people are like, the total opposite of like, I don't want to look at it at all. I don't want to think about it at all. And so it's just kind of refreshing to know, oh, it doesn't have to be so effortful. We actually can give ourselves permission to totally have Netflix binges and, you know, do something completely unrelated to the grief and then come back to it when we're ready. And we just go back and forth and back and forth. And there's no finish line. We're always going to have thoughts and feelings about a loss. That's grief, right? right? Thoughts and feelings about a loss. It's we're always going to have them. So it's really just a matter of moving from, can I, can I, (laughs) instead of just accepting everything that shows up in my brain, right? Mm -hmm. Can I eventually start choosing how I want to think and feel on purpose about the loss, right? Integrating Mm -hmm. intentionally what we want to think and feel, what we have learned about the loss. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean we're never going to be sad. It doesn't mean we're going to feel amazing that the loss happened. Yep. It doesn't mean it's over. I would think too, does it, I'm sure it makes a difference on the type of death if you will right like if somebody um like the grieving process could be different depending on how the person died whether they died of old age uh they had alzheimer's um they had an accident they committed suicide it was like a long term like uh drug issue right does that make a difference on it does make a difference, but I just always caution that it's still not ever formulaic and it can still, mm-hmm. you know, some, someone's response to their loved one's death by suicide and someone else's response to their loved one's death by suicide. They might have similarities, but they also might have a lot of differences too. Mm-hmm. That's okay. Right. And, and, and sometimes you might think, well, it'll be significantly harder if it was someone we had a good relationship with quote unquote, mm-hmm. while they were living compared to someone, maybe we were estranged from not right. necessarily. Yeah. Right. Or yep. is it, is it harder because you didn't see the death coming compared to when you had time to adjust to it? Not necessarily. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I just, it's, it's just going to be what it is. If you can yeah. allow the feelings to flow through, not put a lot of pressure on yourself, decide that there's no right or wrong way to do it. Know that you can eventually choose how you want to think and feel about this loss and integrate it into your life. It's still always going to be a part of your life experience. The goal isn't to get over it, right? Mm. Then it just gets, a, it gets a little easier. And if there are, you know, maybe traumatic aspects to it, like for me, there were right, it's right. Not for everyone, but for me, there were, can I get the support I need around that so that I'm right. not, you know, not suffering with flashbacks perpetually or yes. you know, every time I saw a CPR scene or, you know, yep. car on the side of the road, th- those kinds of things, I really needed to get support around that and support yeah. is available for that. We don't yeah. have to be tired. Yeah, yeah um, exactly. Like the, the PTSD that you can actually get from that. Yeah. And I, for myself, like I watched my brother die and felt his last heartbeat. Yeah. I, I didn't know that I was traumatized by it. I always thought like trauma was just something like just really, really bad. You know, I mean, yes, not to say that isn't tea. bad, but in my mind, yeah, like big T. And I was like, yeah, it's probably little T. People watch people die all the time, right? Yeah. You know, and then a year later, I was still having nightmares. I was still getting triggered by certain things. I was like, maybe I've got a little PTSD from watching my brother die. Yeah. And then that's how I actually read the book, uh, how the body keeps the score. Yes. Such a good what it's one. called. Yeah. yeah. Or the body keeps something like that. Um, and then I found out about EMDR. Yeah. And so then I found a therapist that did EMDR and you know, that's the thing too. I've always been very pro therapy. I've seen therapists mm-hmm. for decades, different therapists and almost for different things. So sometimes you do have to find a therapist that will work with you with that, you know, and you got to feel comfortable. I mean, especially yes. if it's such a sensitive subject for you, then you definitely want someone that you feel like you can just totally just let go. Totally. Yeah. And remind yourself, like you're the customer in that situation, right? right? So if it's not a good fit, move on Yeah, and find, find someone who you really can connect with, because if if you don't have that, it's not going to be helpful. I EMDR, I didn't personally love, I've had Mm -hmm. so many clients who've had tremendous success with it, but tapping has been, Oh yeah. Tapping's good. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I actually have the tapping, uh, okay. Think of the name. The tapping solution. 
Yes, I have yes, that. And I met that guy when his first book, his uh-huh. first, his book first came out. Um, I was at a Hay House uh, seminar oh, so and fun. he was, he's so nice. Um, but yeah, Taffy's great. I actually did uh, about a year ago, year and a half ago, I did ketamine. Uh, oh, which yeah. has been, yeah. And I just had someone on the show recently, uh, that she specializes in that ketamine for mm-hmm. divorce, depression, dependency, mm. et cetera. Um, so yeah, that, that, and so again, sometimes like, if you feel like something's not working, try right. something else. Yes. Yes. Right. So that you're not just, okay. Like you, and you, every single person out there deserves to be more than just, okay. Thank you. Yeah. And that's where I see so many women they, they don't realize that. Yeah. Or I think it's kind of like the frog in boiling water where it just, mm-hmm. it maybe changed so gradually that it's yeah. not terrible, but it's not great. Yep. And so you almost don't even recognize it's like that space where good is the enemy of great, you know? Mm-hmm. And in grief, yeah. I see that because of the languaging we use when we say new normal, people are like, well, I'm no longer, it no longer sucks as much as much as it did in the beginning. Yeah. Therefore I'm, I'm fine. It's I'm fine. fine. Everything's fine. Instead yeah. of, oh, wait, post-traumatic growth. That could be possible. And, and I feel like too, we kind of talked about this before, is that even giving yourself permission to to go on to live an extraordinary life. And, and that doesn't yeah. mean, you know, especially if it's with a spouse, like they would want you to, you know, like you you deserve to, to live, to be happy. Yeah. And I, to and not I, feel I, guilty about that. I totally agree. I, interestingly enough, I have seen situations where I'm not convinced the spouse actually would have won. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. I actually, after the words left my mouth, I was like, wait a minute, there's probably yeah, there's some, some out there. Some, there's probably some out there that would. Yeah. It, but you know, crazy what enough, you, but yeah. Yeah. And your, um, your podcast, what's, what's the title of your podcast? It's called the widowed mom podcast, the widowed mom. So mm-hmm. obviously mom, children, so that's another thing too. Like you're not only, and I can looking back for myself, like when my, you know, husband had passed away, then as a mother, you're like, I got to take care of the children. And mm-hmm. then you kind of put your own emotions and feelings aside and your own grief yeah. aside. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's so cliche, but it's really so true, right? You have to put the oxygen mask on yourself first yes. because it seems like it's better to just put yourself last. But what really happens mm-hmm. is at a certain point you realize, oh, this is actually a marathon. Mm-hmm. I thought this was a sprint. This is a marathon. And if I'm not taking care of yeah. myself and sometimes it's not even big things. It's like, if I'm not learning how to, to change my relationship with emotions mm-hmm. so that they can flow through me, how do I then role model that for my kids? How do I, if yeah. I'm not willing to address my emotional challenges, how can I ever expect that I can show them how to address theirs? Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think that's why a lot of us end up in the place. I don't know about you, but where, you know, parents mm-hmm. are just kind of emotions are problems. You, if you want to cry, cry alone. You like, right. you know, if you want to cry, I'll give you something yep. to cry about it. You, know, yeah. you end up having like this whole experience where you do isolate when you're feeling negative emotion, you do think of emotions as problem to solve instead of feelings to allow. And if yes. we don't figure that out for ourselves, we, we just can never help our kids. That's one of my favorite things about the work I do is mm. working with moms. And then I watch it ripple mm. into their children's mm. lives. And, and, and it, I can, sometimes they'll tell me stories about how, you know, something they taught or role model to their child. And then they watch their child teach or role model it to a friend. Oh. Just yes. Like I'm so glad you said that. Um, again, I got, I did a show, uh, it was Monday show and it was about getting triggered and breaking mm-hmm. that cycle again, like, you know, the mental health awareness, breaking that cycle, because mm-hmm. like once it, in, it's up to each individual person to take care of their own mental health. Yeah. And when you do that, you're breaking that cycle. You're, you're, it's like an, uh, a, a ripple effect, right. Yeah. Of, of kindness and, and, and understanding and all of that, that can carry on for generations to come. And and it's up to each individual individual person to do that. So I'm so glad you said that. So uh, interestingly, uh, I have a friend um, where their best friend committed suicide. Yes. Mm. Two days ago. Oh, geez. And even though I have uh, dealt with like death in my own life, right. And I went to lunch with him yesterday and I found myself kind of like, what do you say? Like, how do you, what is the best way to help someone 
dealing with a loss. Yeah. Grieving. I think that's such a common concern, right? Yeah. So I think if we go into it, understanding why it's so uncomfortable in the first place, that will really mm-hmm. help. Right. Okay. And the reason it's so uncomfortable for most of us is that we have been taught to believe that negative emotions are problems. Right. Right. So naturally we, most of us don't have the capacity or practice to sit with someone who is having a lot of negative emotion without mm. trying to change it. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So if we understand that, we're like, oh, okay, the reason this is so uncomfortable for me, it really doesn't have anything to do with them. It's because I haven't really developed the muscle of allowing other people to feel uncomfortable and allowing yes. myself to feel uncomfortable as they feel uncomfortable. And so if we can just even doing that, I think goes so far because when we do that, that's what helps us stop saying stupid stuff. Right. And we don't have to say, we don't have to say the things that people receive as minimizing, right? right. Like that. I don't know what you heard when your husband died, but you know, mm-hmm. the, you're so young, you'll find oh. someone else. They're mm. in a better place. Don't mm-hmm. be sad. It'll be okay. You're going to make it like we say things that because we're trying to make people feel differently because then, then we can feel better. And if we can just right. be like, no, it's totally okay that they feel how they feel. And then yes. all we have to do is just witness it. Just be mm-hmm. there. Right? Like this sucks. And I love you. This sucks. Yeah. And I'm here. And I'm not trying to change it. I'm not trying to fix it. And, and reminding ourselves too, that sometimes as the griever, it's always on the griever's mind. Mm -hmm. We're usually like, Ooh, they might not be thinking about it. They look like they're doing okay. So if I mention it, it's probably going to, you know, it's going (laughs) to set them backwards or it's going to remind them of something they they have, they're not thinking about currently. That is almost never true, right? Usually the griever is the one thinking about it all the time and feeling forgotten. Mm-hmm. And wishing other people would acknowledge that it actually happened because it looks like they all went back to living. Mm-hmm. Oh, did you freeze? I think I lost you. Yeah. So basically, if we were just trying to stop, try. Okay. Let's try that again. <laughs> we can, we can always start the recording now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Essentially what we need to do is stop worrying about other people's negative emotions and stop trying to solve it. Right. And yep. just know that it's totally fine for them to feel how they feel. We don't need to try to make them feel better. We just need to be good witnesses for whatever yeah. it is that they are feeling. And that's when people feel comfortable in our presence and we feel less awkward. Yeah. And like you said too, negative emotions are okay. I I feel like sometimes, especially with social media, that everything is positive and happy and wonderful. And if it's not, then, oh my gosh, like the world is coming to an end. Like it's okay. Like I think of emotion as E energy in motion and you need to let those emotions flow through you. Like if you're, especially with the grieving process, like I mentioned before with my brother, Um, And then at the same time, I decided to go ahead and grieve for my ex from like 15 years before. Um, But, but yeah, I know. Right. But the thing is, is like, it's, it's okay. Like if you feel angry one minute, sad, the next happy that like, just flow with it, just let it keep flowing and flowing and flowing. And then eventually it's like, some of those emotions will just kind of take care of themselves. Like, I mean, Mm -hmm. obviously with a lot of work too, but not to be scared of them is basically what I'm saying. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and when they show up, not to make it mean anything has gone wrong. Right. Like, because otherwise it's really easy for people to be like, well, I was doing great. And then I regressed. Yes. No, you didn't regress. You're just a human yep. experiencing an emotion and that's okay. And it's not a yep. problem to solve. It's just an experience to allow, right. It's just a wave to yeah. surf. Yeah. Yeah. You're a human being, more. being human. Like right. it's just. And who in grief, who you don't want to be happy all the time. Yeah. Right. You don't want to be happy if oh. your person died. That's weird. Right. Yeah. Right? So, <laughs> so when somebody tries to talk you out of how you're feeling, it's received as weird. Yes. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You're exactly right. So let's talk about, um, correct me if I'm wrong on this term, post-traumatic growth mindset. Yeah. Let's yeah. I remember that. the first time I heard post-traumatic growth, it was like one of those moments where the record scratches and you're like, whoa, 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 what? Like post-traumatic <laughs> what? Cause you know, everybody's talking about post-traumatic stress disorder, but post-traumatic growth was a new one for me anyway. So it was a, a 
term that was coined in the mid nineties by a couple of researchers, Tedeschi and Calhoun were their names. And they just happened to be kind of noticing that <clears throat> some people were experiencing something traumatic. And again, not, not big T, not little T, tra you know, traumatic being different in, in the eye of the beholder, but there was like a level of wellness that people would experience before something traumatic happened. And then some people would dip down below that level of wellness and stay there. Mm. Some people would dip down below that level of wellness and bounce back to the level of wellness they were experiencing before. And some people would dip down, but not just bounce back. They would actually bounce forward. Ah. They would actually report greater levels of life satisfaction after the trauma and not, not in spite of it, but because right. of it. Yes. Right? Yep. And, and so that's what their work was about is like, what's happening here, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the takeaway there is just because something traumatic happens to you doesn't ever take away your ability to decide what you want to do with that. Right. Right. So I like to use the, the, the idea because I live in Kansas, like if a tornado comes and knocks down your mm -hmm. house, you could rebuild the house. If you wanted, you could like give the same building plans to a builder and have them rebuild the exact same house, right? That would not be good, bad, right, wrong. It would just be a choice. Mm -hmm. Also though, you probably lived in that house for a minute. You probably have some opinions on changes you might like to make, right? More natural lighting in a room, mm -hmm. more electrical outlets, a bigger whatever, right? So if you're going to rebuild your house, you do have the option to redesign it and make mm -hmm. and take into account what you have learned in the time that you have lived there. Right. And I we can that. do that too. Yeah. After any trauma, we can decide, all right, what do I want to take into account? What is the wisdom that I have learned? Does, does this help me reassess my values? Does this mm -hmm. help me reassess my relationships, right? Create stronger right. relationships. Does this help me mm -hmm. spiritually? Like, what do I want to do with this? And then I can redesign. And, and if we do that, it doesn't mean we didn't love the old house. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It's not, it's not the morally superior option. Mm hmm. It's yeah, just and, and shifting your perspective of of a, a new chapter and a new life, despite the past, right? And yeah. it's actually like you said too, because of going through that tragedy, you are able to even be come out better on the other side. I mean, I right. think of like, hence the name of the show, the midlife makeover, like literally making over your life and yeah. taking that experience and learning from it. I mean, I've learned so much from the losses that I've had in my life. Mm -hmm. And I'd say the, my biggest lesson from them is, and actually from even the, the death that happened yesterday to my friend's friend, mm -hmm. that life is precious. And it's, you get this one life, this one yeah. wild, precious life. What are you going to yeah. do with it? Same. And I just like, I think about my own, I'm like, and I just went to my aunt Annie's 90th birthday. And I think I want to be like her when I hit 90, I want to be vibrant. I want to be dancing yeah. and singing. And, and we do have to think like, what am I doing with my life? And just like you said, like, even if it's deconstruct, you feel like it's completely deconstructing, you have the right and the power to reconstruct it, to make it into something even better. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. that's the same journey I see almost all of my clients going through and for yeah. sure what happened to me, it's like, you wake up and you're like, wait a minute, is this how I want to live my life? Like, yeah. Do I want to be in this job? Do I want these relationships? Is this, is this aligned for me with what I, what I value and what I want to see? Right. And then it's totally okay if it's not. And also now I can make choices. Yeah. Rebuild with more natural light. <laughs> yeah. 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 So tell us where we can find you. So the widowed mom podcast is obviously it sounds very niche, but if anybody's interested in grief, generally speaking, or post-traumatic growth, I have a lot of listeners that aren't widows or moms, so they can totally yeah. connect with me there. And then coaching with Krista.com is where all of my socials live, you know, and all of my information lives. Um, so they can connect with me there too. I love it. You've been awesome. I've enjoyed Thank this. You. Thanks yeah. for being willing to talk about tough stuff. I really, oh, that's my favorite. Actually, yeah. the fluffy stuff is boring. <laughs> I love that. It is boring. I, who it needs is. the fluff anymore? Amen. You know, I'm just go you. on Instagram. Lots of fluff there. Lots of fluff there. <laughs> fluff for sale. Fluff for, fluff for sale. Thank you so much, Krista. Thanks for having me, Wendy. All right. Bye-bye.